Hey guys, welcome back to Combo Class. I'm your teacher, Demotro, again, and we're gonna do one more mathematical lesson before we move on to some other units, like talking about language and stuff. Now, in this math unit so far, we had one class talking about nines, which were important because they're the highest single digit number in the way we count. And then we went over to 12s. And we used that as an example of what we called an anti-prime because of how many ways you could divide it. Well, what about 13 that they don't allow on clocks for some dumb reason? 13's an example of an anti-anti-prime, or just a prime for short. Primes are actually pretty, pretty important, but why are primes important? Well, there's this thing called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which is a pretty grandiose big title to give something, tells us that every number has a unique prime factorization, meaning something like 28 can be broken down into primes, two times two times seven, sometimes written as two squared times seven. And this is the only way to break down 28. So any number has only one set of primes that make it up as its building blocks. Some numbers like 29 are already prime, so nothing else going on there. Other numbers like 30, for example, also have a unique prime factorization. Now this kind of makes primes the fundamental building blocks of all numbers. Even if you just had primes and multiplication, we could make every number. So way back in the day, when mathematicians didn't have computers or anything, no internet, but they knew that numbers could be prime, and they knew this fundamental theorem of arithmetic, what questions would they have? Well, the mathematician Euclid, in his work Elements, about 2,300 years ago, had some interesting thoughts about primes, some interesting questions, and some of them had answers. I'm gonna show some crazy proofs, pretend I'm Euclid for a minute, and show on the whiteboard whether we can prove some strange things about primes. So we're teleporting back in time. Maybe we got a few more clocks and a few more dice than Euclid. Oh! So one of the first questions that's pretty basic that came to Euclid, are there an infinite infinite number of primes. You could kind of imagine it going either way. Like as you go up the number line, they become sparser, but maybe they keep happening. Or maybe you get to a point on the number line where everything can be built in some way from the previous primes, just more and more of them, a higher exponent on the old primes we already had. Can we prove whether there are infinite primes or not? Well, it turns out maybe we can. So for my version of Euclid's proof, because he used math in a kind of different way, they treated numbers kind of more like distances with straight edges and compasses. My version of the proof will be a little more modern for you guys to understand. So it's gonna introduce a little term called the primorial. Now you might remember the factorial was if we put an exclamation mark after a number, it multiplies all the numbers up to that. Like seven factorial would be all the numbers multiplied up to seven. Now a primorial, which they write with actually this number sign hashtag thingy, means just multiply the primes up to that number. And it doesn't come up quite as often as the factorial in math, but it's still special, still useful, and it's gonna come in handy in this proof. So how would you even go about proving that there's infinite of a thing? Well, there's a few ways to do it, but we're gonna use a little thing called proof by contradiction. Let's assume that there were a finite number of primes, and then we'll prove that that's impossible. So if there were a finite number of primes, there's some prime, we'll call it PZ, which is the biggest prime. And I'm gonna put a question mark because we're trying to prove whether this assumption is actually possible or leads to a contradiction. Now, let's take the primorial of that. So we're multiplying every single prime in this case. Now, let's add one to the primorial. This would also work similarly if we subtracted one, but it's gonna be a little easier to visualize if we add one. And let's call this a new number, Q. So Q is equal to all the primes multiplied up to the biggest prime plus one. So Q either is a prime itself, which would be bigger than PZ and already lead to a contradiction, or is a composite number made up of primes with that fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So since it being a prime would already lead to a contradiction, let's assume it's composite. 
It has some prime factors, one of which we'll just call Px. Px will be whatever one of the factors of Q is. So Px, if it really is a prime, is a factor of this Pz primorial. It's one of the ones we multiplied. But how could it be a factor of Pz primorial and a factor of Q that's one more than Pz primorial? If it's a factor and evenly divides PZ primorial, then trying to evenly divide Q would leave a remainder of one. And there are a couple different ways you can demonstrate that no prime number, or in fact, no number bigger than one, could be a factor of two consecutive numbers. We've led to a contradiction. This either is a factor of two consecutive numbers or is a prime not on the list. So, Pz can't exist. For any prime, there will always be a bigger prime. Now let's demonstrate it another way, just in case that didn't make sense. Can we do it with our good old friend, the factorial? Oh, I love the factorial. We're gonna have so much fun with that symbol in the future. With factorials, let's say we're looking at n factorial for a particular number n. You could pick any number n and look at its n factorial, and you could also look at its n factorial plus one. So n factorial plus one for any given n either could be prime, which would mean that for any n, including a big prime you plug in, you get a bigger prime. So that would mean there's infinite primes, or it's not prime and has a prime factor, because anything that's not prime, we saw with the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, can be broken down into prime factors. So if it has a prime factor, either that prime factor is on the list of numbers that multiplied up to n, meaning it's a factor of n factorial itself, and once again, we can't have a factor of two consecutive numbers, or it's not on the list of numbers that led up to n, but it's a prime, meaning there's another prime that's not on the list. So for any prime you put in n, you're gonna get another prime, and the prime's gonna be bigger than it, showing that we can make infinite primes. So if you were Euclid and you proved that there were infinite primes 2,300 years ago, what other questions would you have? Well, I think two kind of clear questions might come to mind, which are, if there are infinite primes, and as you go up the number line, they seem to be sparser. They seem to happen less often as you go up. Well, are the gaps something that can keep growing and be up to a nearly infinite size? Or do the gaps have a limit that the primes always happen on a certain cycle? And how about the tiny gaps? Are we gonna keep having primes that are on consecutive odd numbers, which are known as twin primes, and are as close as primes can be apart from two and three down there? Apart from that, the closest primes could be would be a twin prime. And the furthest they could be would be what we call an arbitrarily large gap. Now, they call it arbitrarily large and not infinite because they use the term infinity for other stuff, like saying that there's infinite many primes, but we're looking to see if you could have a gap of up to the size of any number you want, including these massive numbers like Graham's number or whatever. All right, let's start by looking at the big gaps and see if they can be arbitrarily large, meaning up to any size. Well, we're gonna bust out our old friend, the factorial, for this proof. So let's say we're taking a number like 100 factorial. That's all the numbers multiplied up through 100. Now, a factorial plus one helped us out last time, but this time we're gonna start with plus two. So 100 factorial itself has two as a factor, meaning it's even. So it plus two must also be even. How about 100 factorial plus three? Well. Since 100 factorial is a multiple of three, and we just went three more than that, that must be a multiple of three. And so if we took 100 factorial and added four, that must be a multiple of four, and plus five must be a multiple of five. So a number like 100 factorial basically kills a bunch of numbers from being possible primes, all the way up from 100 factorial plus two through 100 factorial plus 100 must be multiples of something. And so that's a prime gap of like, I guess, 98. So 100 factorial gives us a prime gap 
that big, we could have done that with a billion factorial or a trillion factorial. So this shows that you can have gaps of any size. And they're gonna happen a lot sooner on the number line than this. This is pretty far out to have a gap of just 100 in the primes. We're gonna have a gap of 100 in the primes a lot sooner. But this shows the infinitude, uh, or I can't use the term infinity, the arbitrarily largeness that these gaps can have. All right, well, it was pretty simple to prove that we can have arbitrarily large gaps. How about tiny gaps? Let's see if we have a simple proof for the fact that something like a twin prime, where primes happen on consecutive odd numbers, keeps happening as we go up the number line and happens infinitely many times and doesn't stop happening when we get to some point. Or maybe it does stop happening, and at some point, the gaps are always bigger than two. Well, for this one, I don't have a good proof. And in the 2300 years since Euclid, they've still been working on a good proof. They haven't cracked this. It's called the twin prime conjecture because they still don't know whether they're infinite twin primes or not. And it's such a simple, logical question that even someone who only half knew math could understand. Are there infinitely many primes that happen as close as they can be, which is consecutive odd numbers, apart from two and three, which are pretty close down there, just a one-time thing. Does the twin prime thing happen again and again? And what about other prime constellations, like primes like this? You can have ones that end in one, three, seven, nine. What constellations keep happening? Well, they were working on that for the last 2,300 years without much progress. And then in 2013, not that long ago, they figured out that there is infinitely many primes that differ. They're looking, remember, to see infinitely many that differ by two. They proved that there are infinitely many primes that differ by at most 70 million. Now that doesn't sound that uh, helpful, does it, Aaron? No. <laughs> but uh, let's compare it to infinity, though. Like it, it's definitely better. It's from infinity as a possibility down to seventy million. Pretty damn good, right? Yeah, definitely. So, in 2013, they got this limit as there must keep being primes at least that close. The primes don't keep spreading. Now, over the years through some brilliant mathematicians, as well as some just group work online from a bunch of different people, this bound has been lowered to 246. Mm -hmm. And they now know that primes, infinitely many times, are at least within 246 of each other. They still haven't gotten down to two to prove the twin prime conjecture. Maybe in our lifetime they will kind of a fun question waiting on the horizon. And it's such a simple question that maybe even someone who doesn't have a math degree or something might find some strange logical Euclidish way of cracking. All right, so since I don't think we're gonna be able to solve the twin prime conjecture right here on the whiteboard today, let me show you one other proof I picked up from online that's pretty awesome and crazy. Did you know that any prime squared, and it has to be a prime bigger than two or three, those guys don't count, but every other prime squared is one bigger than a multiple of 24. So it minus one being a multiple of 24 is the same as saying it's one bigger than a multiple of 24, which sounds absurd. How could that be true for every prime? It seems like a formula that lets us know where the primes are, which is still a mystery, the distribution of them. Uh, but you can't backtrack it. You can't go to every multiple of 24, add one, square root it, and get a prime. So it turns out, weirdly, this strange fact is true, and I can prove it for you. Let's look at a number line. Got some numbers here. Here's where we'll pick a prime to live. That could be any prime. Now, primes can't be even, so the ones on the side of it must both be even, and so both of those must both, both be multiples of two. They have, I'm just writing times two, but it means that they're a multiple of two. We could evenly divide them by two because they're even numbers, unlike the prime. Now, how about multiples of three? We got three in a row numbers here. Out of three numbers, you always have one of them that's a multiple of three. So one of these three must be a multiple of three. 
and it's not the prime for sure. Now we can even take this one step deeper because every other even number has to be a multiple of four. So one of these is a multiple of four. So we have a multiple of four, and the other one is at least a multiple of two, whichever other one it is. And we have a multiple of three. Altogether, two times three times four has to be somehow contained as factors between these two numbers. Now, why would that matter? Those numbers are just random. They're P plus one and P minus one. And wait a minute, that's how they factorize P squared minus one. P squared minus one breaks up like, like this. What that means is that if we multiply these two numbers together, the ones on the side of the prime, that result must have two, three, and four as a factor. And you might remember from our highly composite episode that that gives us good old 24. So every P plus one times P minus one is a multiple of 24. Thus every P squared minus one is a multiple of 24. And thus in simpler terms, every prime, if you square it, is one more than a multiple of 24. Apart from two and three, they're too small to work. All right, that's enough math for now. I'll take a break. I mean, I could get carried away and talk about Gaussian primes or the Riemann hypothesis or all sorts of stuff. My friends know I like to rant about primes. We'll come back to them later, but I think that was enough for the math unit for a minute. And we're gonna transition next episode for kind of half mathy, half languagey episode, and then move over to analyzing a little bit more about language and words. So let's move on to unit two. Thanks guys, I love you if you've been watching. We'll put a smiley face for the heck of it and oh.